I was working weekend security at a chemical plant on a skeleton crew. Most of the production was shut down and the quality lab itself only had one worker inside for the entire 12 hour shift. This sort of thing tended to make me nervous because I never considered working alone there to be safe. Even though everyone there had a chemistry background, accidents still happened in the quality lab from time to time, typically with the new hires. One weekend a vessel exploded and took out one of the lab walls. So every time we had a new employee working back there, I was always extremely high strung. So one Saturday morning, an employee I didn't recognize came into the building to sign in. I inspected her badge and she told me she was new. I asked her where they had assigned her and she said the quality lab. So yeah, instant tension. I walked her back to the lab and told her we'd be coming back to check on her periodically. This was something we started doing after learning that some of the chemicals they worked with in the bays included cyanide and ether. A few patrols into my shift and all seemed well. I'd peek in through the window on the lab door and wave at her. She'd smile and wave back. She seemed to be getting along pretty well in the lab. Toward the end of the shift, I got back from my final patrol and asked my partner if the new girl had signed out yet. He said no. He hadn't seen her leave. I sat back at the desk and finished writing out my shift log. Half an hour went by and still no sign of the new girl. It wasn't really common for anyone in the lab to stay longer than scheduled, and her shift had ended almost an hour ago. I was starting to worry. We checked all the common areas first and didn't see her. We then checked the restrooms and locker rooms only to turn up with nothing. I didn't like the way this was looking. I went back to the lab and called out before entering. I didn't want to run inside and risk startling her in case she was still inside the lab room handling chemicals. I got no response. I went inside and the room appeared empty. I was now worried that this might turn from a simple wellness check to a body recovery effort. I made my way over to the bay and looked inside the window. It was empty. This wasn't making any sense. She never came to the front of the building to check out with security, and if she had exited any of the side doors she would have tripped the alarms. I asked my partner what type of car she arrived in and to check the lot for it. He didn't see what she arrived in, but in the end that really made no difference. You see, with the exception of both our cars, the parking lot of our building was empty. Where was she? Our shift ended and we both headed for home. The next morning, another quality lab tech was on shift and I asked him about the new girl that was working the previous day. He said he didn't know anything about any new employee working in the lab the previous day. In fact, there wasn't even anyone scheduled to work in the lab on that Saturday. I checked the sign-in sheet from the day before and saw that where you would have normally written your name, the woman had simply drawn a smiley face. Which leads me to wonder, who the hell was this person? Where did she get the ID card from? How could she have possibly left the building without setting off the alarms if she did use the side doors to exit? And if she didn't, how could she have possibly gone past us without anybody noticing? How did she get on site if we couldn't find a car in the parking lot? Was this just some strange person like a former employee that managed to sneak onto the property? And if so, what was she doing inside the lab while we were on patrol? And if this wasn't a person, then what exactly was it? I met this girl on a phone chat line in the early 1990s. We hit it off pretty well and I suggested we should meet up sometime. That was pretty risky at the time since you had no way to know what the person looked like, what their intentions were and so on. But I took a gamble and after meeting with her a few days later, she was everything she said she was and more. She was beautiful. She liked the same things I did too. Board games, RPGs, all that nerdy stuff. I spent the next few weeks stopping over at her place to hang out after work. Things quickly developed from a friendship into a relationship, and almost instantly, the problems began. I don't mean with her and the relationship, I mean something else. I started getting phone calls in the middle of the night. Usually they would hang up right away when I answered. 
Sometimes there would be silence on the other end. Sometimes breathing. One night after I left her place, a truck pulled up behind me on the highway and turned on its brights. I thought whoever it was was just trying to pass me. So I switched lanes, only for the driver to follow me over to the next lane. I tried to speed up and the truck kept matching my speed, driving mere inches from my bumper. I changed lanes again and this time, the driver stayed in the opposite lane. I thought maybe this was just some punk kid playing a prank on me, until he pulled alongside my car and ran me off the road. I wasn't injured, but my car took some damage. I filed a police report about the incident, but there wasn't much that could be done since I never caught the plate number and could only give a vague description of the truck. A few nights later, I was sleeping in my living room when I heard the sound of glass breaking outside my house. I thought maybe someone was trying to break in, so I grabbed my hunting rifle, exited my back door, and circled around to the driveway. I didn't see anyone, but I heard and felt the distinct crunch of broken glass underneath my slippers. Someone had thrown a large garden rock through the back window of my car. The next day after filling out a police report again, I went to talk with my new girlfriend about the experiences I'd been having the last few weeks. She didn't really say much about it, but she did seem genuinely worried. As I left her place and started walking toward my car, a truck began slowly driving past me. I figured the driver was lost after he got to the end of the street, turned around and started driving back in my direction. I had barely got my key in the car door when I looked up and saw a gun barrel pointing at me from the truck's window. I immediately dropped to the ground and the truck quickly sped off. I didn't get a good look at the driver, but I did get a make, model, and color of the truck. Once again, I went to the police to file a report, but without a license plate number, they couldn't help much. They asked me if anyone I knew had any reason to try and harm me or intimidate me. I said no. A few nights later, there was a knock at my door. It was the police. They said they received a call that I had been threatening someone with a hunting rifle, and the caller described my car, my appearance, gave my address, and the type of rifle I owned. I wasn't arrested, but they did cite me for disorderly conduct. This whole situation was crazy. This was like something out of the Twilight Zone. I called my girlfriend to tell her what was happening, and she started crying. She then confessed to me that everything that had been happening the last few weeks was being done by her ex-boyfriend. He had been stalking her for a while, and when he saw me leaving her house, he began following me. She talked about how he always wore camo, carried a knife in his belt, and watched her through binoculars. The truck I described was the same color and model he drove as well. I didn't have any other evidence than that, and obviously that wasn't good enough. For both our safety, I stopped seeing her. About six months later, I was having breakfast in Denny's when I overheard someone at another table talking about how he used to harass this guy that was dating his ex-girlfriend. He was dressed head to toe in camo, and I could see a hunting knife clipped to his belt. I looked in the parking lot and saw that same truck from six months earlier that had driven past me on the street, the same truck that had driven me off the road. When he left the restaurant, I followed him out to his truck and I beat the hell out of him. You can believe this story or not. That's entirely up to you. But I lived it. I know it's true. So this happened a few years back. I was about 11. My dad owns a bounce house company, so we went to set up a bounce house somewhere. Well, it was miserably hot that day, so I decided I would go sit in the car in the air conditioning. I was playing on my phone when suddenly I hear a small beep noise. I looked and there was an old man who was probably in his 60s in a Volkswagen. He motioned with his finger for me to come over to him. My dad is also a cop, so I know all about stranger danger. So I shook my head no. Then he got out of his car and came up and pulled on the car door handle. Thank God it was locked. He seemed pissed when he realized it was locked, so he asked me to roll down the window. 
By this point, I was crying and hyperventilating from fear. At that point, my dad came over and said, What's going on? And apparently this old guy said, I just wanted to show her my dancing chicken toy. And when my dad told me that, I thought it was odd. The scariest part was, he said, let me get it out of my car. He then got in his car and quickly took off. I'm terrified to even think what would have happened if I had gotten out of the car. While I was in college, I lived in a college apartment for one year. I don't think it was a very old apartment building, and if anyone had ever died there, I was certainly unaware. I had three roommates, two of whom had lived there the previous year. The girl in the bedroom right next to mine moved in at the same time I did. Once we moved in, some strange things started happening. The other two roommates had said that nothing like this had ever happened before. It started with the TV in the living room. The four of us were sitting on the couch watching TV. The remote was sitting under the table that the TV was on, upside down. The back was off the remote so we could see that there were no batteries in it. The volume on the TV was a little too low, and I commented on it, asking anyone to turn it up. Of course, we were all too lazy to do it, so we just sat there. However, the volume bar on the TV started to go up, and remarkably stopped at a comfortable volume. We were all pretty spooked, but it didn't scare us too much. After some discussion, we had decided that if our apartment was haunted, it was probably haunted by either a kind spirit, or one with a sense of humor. After that, I started hearing strange noises at night. Not like noises you would expect to hear in a college apartment complex, but very mechanical ticking noises. The part that really got me though, only happened one night in my bedroom. I was in bed in the dark trying to get to sleep, when I heard a loud thud on the wall behind my head. Immediately after that, the following things happened in a perfect clockwise circular pattern around my room. The mirrored door on my closet shook. Right after it shook, my bedroom doorknob, just to the right of it, began turning rapidly. That stopped, and my bathroom doorknob, just to the right of my room door, turned rapidly. After that, my VCR, which was to the right of my bathroom, turned on, and then off by itself. The window to the right of the VCR then began to shake, then the thud behind me again. This circle went around three times, and then stopped. I had no idea what was going on, and I had absolutely no explanation as to what was making the noises. Nobody else had any experiences in their bedrooms, and I didn't have any more after that, but the TV in the living room was still affected. I've long moved out since then, but I still think it was an interesting story. Also, I was interested in theories on what, or who, was in our apartment. About a year ago, I was in my dorm browsing various websites on my laptop. Websites like LiveLeak were my main destination for disturbing images and videos, but there was one video that intrigued me. It was titled, Distress. I clicked onto the video. It started out normal. It looked like some kind of torture vid. Room was dark, clanging in the background. And then I heard the most stomach-curdling noise. The noise was someone in pain. No! They were screaming, going up to a full screech. The sound of ripping flesh made me gag. The screen was still on the black background. No movement whatsoever. Then I realized, the noise wasn't coming from the video. It was coming from the room a few dorms over. I hadn't had the volume up. The noise stopped for a while. Then suddenly... Oh my god, did I wake up. I instantly jumped up out of my chair and fell on the floor. My laptop fell on my chair in a way that I could still see what website it was on. But it wasn't on LiveLeak. It was static. The laptop must have fell too hard. But then, hidden in the static, was a person. 
their face was blown off. You could still see the bare muscle and flesh, along with bits and pieces of the skull poking out. The screen flashed to black. It must have died. I was using it all night. I put it on charge and I went to bed. My roommate was out with friends, so I was alone here. I left my laptop open and charging. I didn't think much of it since I was tired and ready to sleep. But that night, I didn't get much sleep. That noise earlier shook me to the point where I couldn't think of anything but the sound of a shotgun blast. I woke up the next day to a loud knock on my door. I instantly thought this was a dorm check. I hid my alcohol under my bed and I scrambled to open the door. A policeman instantly started cramming questions onto me. Where were you at 11pm last night? I was in the storm. Have you heard or seen anything unusual lately? Uh, no officer. Everything was fine last night. Thank you sir. I shut the door and realized I had forgotten the whole incident last night. I knew I couldn't tell him now. He would think I'm crazy for forgetting something like that. But I opened the door, peeked my head out, and looked up and down the hall. The officer was nowhere to be found. The halls were at least 40 feet long, so there was no way he walked out of sight in the three seconds after I shut the door. But I didn't think much of it after. Classes were stressful. Work piled up. I couldn't take it anymore. I walked up and down the hallway knocking on every door. I asked every one of them, have you heard anything strange lately? Most opened the door and politely answered no. One dorm room allegedly had no owner, but when I knocked, the door opened. No one answered it, but the door itself creaked open to reveal a room covered entirely by bed sheets, the couch, recliner and beds, although one item remained uncovered. A laptop. It sat on the bed with a static screen. I saw the same freaky image of a man with his face blown off. But then I realized something. The man was wearing familiar clothing. He was wearing my clothing. I was terrified at this point and immediately left the room. Later that day, I find a SWAT team entering the dorm building. They were looking for someone dangerous. They came out with someone and gave the okay for everyone to come back in. I waddled back to my dorm drenched in fear. I found the door to the white room kicked in. The SWAT found the man in there. I was in that room for a solid minute and could have died. Every waking moment, I'm paranoid to walk into any room including my house, and I never found out how they got the image of my face blown off. Let's just say, I won't be on the deep web for a while. I was scared of the dark as a child. It's a common enough fear, many children share it. The difference is, I was scared not of the darkness and being unable to see in it. It was the things I could see in the dark. As a child, I slept on a love seat in the family room of my home. My mother Sandy, despite having a room of her own, slept on the couch next to my love seat. A small table connected them in the shape of a reversed letter L. My love seat faced the direction of the TV, which was up against the same wall as our house's fireplace but there would often not be a fire, and for my first few years, the TV would be turned off at night. The room would be plunged into pure darkness, and in my mother's sweet memory I say, God did I hate it. I was a very frightened child, often scared of boogeymen and nightmares like one about a demonic fiend who resembled Zorak from Space Ghost hiding in my fridge, among other dreams. Many a night I awoke from a nightmare and began to see sinister shapes in the shadows against the wall with the fireplace staring at me. 
most of these creatures have faded from my memory, but one sticks out in my mind. It was the figure of a cartoonishly tall and thin man with no distinct features, other than what appeared to be a cowboy hat on its head. As time went on, life began to seem scarier than some of my nightmares. Shortly before my eighth birthday, my great-grandmother, who I and my sister Erin called Old Grandma, passed away in her sleep. A few months later, my mother died of breast cancer. After that, my temper grew worse and my thoughts grew darker. I watched horror movies religiously, studying them and using what I learned to terrify my classmates and neighbors. By the time I had reached high school, my temper and behavior were in better check, though my mouth still often got me in trouble at school. I remember watching a horror movie that featured a character called the Shadow Man, and curious if he was based on a real legend, I googled him and came across something called Shadow People. One thing that caught my attention was that they were often described as wearing a hat. I immediately had a flashback to my strange encounter with the strange shadow as a small boy and had to wonder, was it really just my imagination? It's been several years since then. I still love to scare people and most of the time I have no problem going for long walks in the dead of night with the trees in my area blocking most of the sky in some areas of the roads and sidewalks. I sleep in a completely dark room and hate it if light comes in while I'm trying to sleep. Though I'm more insecure about the grave than ghosts these days, I still wonder about that strange evening. My mother told me before she and I moved into the house with the rest of our family that the spirits of a little boy and girl haunted the house, and if a man entered the house, they would either slam doors or be heard running up and down the stairs to the upstairs. My uncle scoffs at the story and refuses to believe it, but sometimes I wonder. <laughs> Let me preface this by saying that this took place in 1997. I was around 15 years old at the time. I'm one of the many guys that grew up without a father figure in his life, and therefore I became part of the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a program that's based in the United States. It takes at-risk youth and provides them with a mentor. This program honestly saved my life. So with that little bit of information out of the way, Here's where the story begins. My big brother was working as a divorce attorney at the time. His time at the office was winding down and he was looking into further business ventures in order to have a decent income when he left. He had been reading into oyster farming and giving it a shot in a few of the surrounding areas. This is pretty easy to do when you're living in the marshland areas of New Jersey. After doing this for a few months and having a rather impressive turnover, he decided to try his hand internationally. After doing some research, he decided he would start in Ecuador. For him, this was a win-win. He traveled a bit, but never visited anywhere in South America. So he'd be able to spot a possible location, plus scratch something off of his bucket list. The trip itself lasted about two weeks, and when he came home, he picked me up and we went out to dinner. The trip had been pretty successful overall. He managed to find five locations, got a slew of amazing photos, and the memories would be something he would never forget. The last bit, however, well, let's call it a mixed bag. About two days after his return, he developed a noticeable limp. He kept complaining about his right foot being insanely sore and itchy. At first, he thought he may have developed a fungal infection due to the fact that he traveled almost everywhere in Ecuador on foot, wearing open-toed sandals. By day four, his foot had swollen to almost twice its size. This was when he made the conscious decision to go to the doctor. He wasn't expecting anything other than being told that he was in need of something along the lines of an antifungal cream. So the game plan was, he would pick me up, 
and we would go to lunch afterwards. I'm sitting there in the doctor's office with him, and he explains to the doctor the exact events leading up to this. While he was explaining to the doctor what happened, with the whole open toe sandal thing, he neglected to tell me one little detail. When he was scouting the second location, he ended up slicing the side of his foot on a rock. He had a med kit in his backpack, but the only thing he had to clean the wound with was saline spray. The cut honestly wasn't that bad, so he went ahead and sprayed it, and then slapped on a bandage. He then went about his merry way looking at the other locales for roughly four hours in dense Ecuadorian rainforest. By the time he'd made his way back to what I guess you could call a base camp, he was exhausted, and honestly he had forgot to go into the med kit and grab the antiseptic. He told the doctor that the hammock that was set up just outside of his tent was looking really good at that point. He was practically asleep before his head hit the pillow. By the time he woke up, the sun was starting to set. He had been down for several hours. This was his second to last day in Ecuador. He started noticing the itch while he was on the flight home. The doctor cocked an eyebrow, and I could see a visible look of concern on his face. He told my big brother he was going to run some cultures in order to rule out a fungal infection, or some other possible cause like a tropical form of poison ivy. He was also going to do an x-ray. The x-ray is where the excrement hit the fan. The doctor came back into the office with one of those miniature surgery kits. Numbing spray, lidocaine, scalpel, suture and needles. He looks at my big brother and simply says, Get up on the table. Now. My big brother starts to freak out a little. What's going on, Doc? The less you know, the better. Just understand we found something on the x-ray and it needs to be cut out. My big brother looked over at me and I was just as freaked out as him. He took a deep breath, hopped up on the table, and put his foot up, and the doctor went to work. I had a full view of the entire procedure. I'm sitting there trying to keep my composure. A little fact about me, I'm an absolute horror junkie. But when it comes to the real thing, I don't handle it very well. So I'm sitting there watching the doctor flay his foot and insert surgical tweezers into the wound, removing something each time. I got a better look at what was being removed. They were roughly the size of a navy bean. This happened no less than six times before I finally got an even better look at these foreign objects. Whatever they were, they were squirming. I excused myself saying that I needed to use the bathroom. I figured that would work a little better and be a lot less concerning than, I'm gonna puke. I barely got the door shut behind me before I did just that. I went back into the office after a little less than 10 minutes of collecting myself in the bathroom and splashing some water on my face. I'm back in the doctor's office and he was suturing up the foot in question. This is when the explanation began. He walked over to my big brother and held up a little jar with nine larvae in it. Sometime between cutting his foot and taking the extended nap, a botfly had laid eggs in the wound. Antiseptic or not, due to the fact that he was walking around in open-toed shoes with an open wound, it was bound to happen. Yeah, I know you're thinking, but he bandaged the wound as well. Well, apparently not well enough. Needless to say, the lunch plans were cancelled. Our appetites were shot to hell at that point. So before I finish this up, I'm going to leave you with the lesson that I learned from this. No matter what kind of forest you're hiking in, never do it in open-toed sandals. Hiking boots exist for a reason, and they don't necessarily need to be expensive. If you do manage to injure yourself, clean out the wound with soap, water, and alcohol. And for God's sakes, make sure the wound is properly covered. A wound getting slightly infected can be annoying, but trust me when I say this. Becoming the host for a parasitic insect is way freaking worse. Other than one other soul, I have never discussed this before. 
I've researched sleep paralysis in depth, and for a while I believed it to be the cause of my experiences. These experiences have only happened at my parents' house. On numerous occasions, I would wake up in my bed, totally incapable of moving anything, but I could blink my eyes. I felt an immense weight on my chest, but nothing was there, just darkness. Not really like a shadow, but a darkness. It would speak to me, and it was always the same grim, raspy whisper. I could not move or say anything. I tried to scream and scream, but no sound would come out. I know this sounds exactly like sleep paralysis, and I wrote it off as such for a long time. I would have liked to believe these visits were just me dreaming and nothing more. However, whenever I'm not sleeping at my house, this has never happened. Not once. When I was living elsewhere, it never happened. But when I moved back home, it started again. Never anywhere else. I kept all this to myself until my cousin came to stay with us for a few months. He had never had this type of experience until he came to stay with us. Several nights in a row, he said he woke up with something choking him, and he couldn't move or talk. He didn't tell me this until after it had happened, about three nights in a row. He asked me out of the blue if I believed in ghosts. I didn't say anything. He then began to tell me about what had been happening to him. I began to tell him about what had been going on, and I told him I thought it was odd that it hadn't been happening to me since he came to stay with us. He was very frightened by the whole ordeal, and we began discussing it. The thing that really bothered me was how he was explaining exactly what I was going through without me saying anything to him about it. Even the types of things in which it said to him were almost exactly like what it was saying to me. Even the voice matched the one I had been hearing. Now up to this point, I guess a person could chalk this up to sleep paralysis or some rational explanation. What happened next, however, is far more chilling and much harder to rationally explain. While we were discussing this, I noticed a sharp change in the room's climate. It seemed very cold, but only in one part of the room and nowhere else. I don't remember exactly what was said right before the noise, but we were talking about the ways to get rid of it when we were silenced by a strange growling sound. It did not sound like anything else I have ever heard in my entire life. The best way to sum it up would be a high-pitched wail like a cat in great pain. The noise seemed to move around us like it was moving towards the door. He looked at me strangely and then suddenly my door slammed shut. It was wide open and it rapidly closed. And I mean hard. This all happened within several seconds. Since that day, neither him nor I have had a similar experience. I sleep much better now and I haven't had anything even remotely similar to this happen to me. Nor has my cousin. I'm in high school. Therefore, from the moment I turned 16, my parents wouldn't shut up about me needing to get a job. I didn't want to work as a waitress or work at a fast food joint, so I settled for babysitting. My experiences for the most part have always been good while babysitting. The kids are usually good, there's free food involved, etc. About two months ago, probably not even that long ago, my mom got a call from an old friend of hers asking if I still babysat. They were going out to a benefit, and they fired their original sitter due to finding out that she had been stealing small things throughout their house. I accepted of course, and finally the day came and I drove over there. I hadn't been to their house before that night, so I had no idea where I was going. When I say they lived far from town, I mean they really lived far from town. It felt like I had been driving for so long that I was already in the next state over. No matter though, soon enough, I see the only house for miles in the distance. I walked up to the front door, did my introductions, etc. She gave me a tour of the house and it was phenomenal. Allow me to give you a rundown of the house. It was two stories, don't forget the attic and the basement. Beautifully decorated, 
Each room was ten times bigger than they needed to be, just a grand house overall. Also, by the time I got there, it was going on 6 p.m., and they were going to be gone until around 2 a.m. From the get-go, small but still creepy things start happening. I would be downstairs watching TV and would hear footsteps coming from upstairs. I would explore the house and would swear I was in a stupid scary movie due to all the jump scares that were happening to me. The kids fell asleep around 8 p.m. They were six and eight, so it was understandable. So I was ready to spend the next six to seven hours alone. At exactly 8.44 p.m., the house phone started ringing. I can remember the exact time because I remember checking the clock thinking to myself, why would somebody be calling? I'm sure they know that these people went to a benefit. It wasn't that big of a deal though, so I answered it. I must have asked, hello, around five times in a row before finally hanging up. About ten minutes later, the phone rings again. Hello? Hello, is anyone there? No answer. So I hang up. Throughout the course of an hour, the phone had rang two more times, but I decided not to answer because I just assumed they were prank calls. Finally though, the phone rings again. I decide I'm going to answer it and tell whoever it is to stop calling. Before I even have the chance to say anything, the person on the other end asks why I didn't pick up the last two times. I ask who it is, and I get no response. I sat there waiting for whoever it was to say something for at least 30 seconds before finally asking them to stop calling. But I like the sound of your voice. I got freaked out and instantly hung up. Immediately after I hung up, I started closing the curtains. You know that feeling you get when you think someone's watching you? Yeah, I had that feeling to the fullest extent. I think I started playing Temple Run or Angry Birds or some stupid game on my phone by that point. I hear someone walking down the stairs, and it's the six-year-old telling me that she's scared of the monster hiding in her closet. I try to comfort her and laugh, telling her that if she just imagines things that she likes, then she won't think about monsters. I walk her back to her room, tuck her in, and close the door behind me. As I'm walking down the stairs, the phone rings again. By now, I'm not only creeped out, but annoyed by whoever keeps calling. I answer it and just flat out ask them what they want. And yeah, you guessed it, I get no answer. After I hang up, someone starts knocking on the front door. Am I that big of an idiot to answer the door in the middle of nowhere at going on 10 something at night? Hell no. I try to look through the peephole, but it was being covered. I call the benefit and ask to speak with the parents. I speak with the mother and just ask if they think they'll be coming home sooner. I tried not to seem like anything was wrong, but I think she could just hear it in my voice. I told her everything was fine, that I was just getting weird phone calls, and that someone had knocked on the door. She asked if I wanted them to come home early, and I felt rude saying yes, so I settled with no. The house phone rings three times within 20 minutes at most, and I ignore all three calls. I really started to wish I had said yes to them coming home early. I tried to distract myself in so many ways possible, but nothing was really helping. The phone rings for the millionth time and I decide to answer it. Don't ask me why. I ask the same questions. Why do you keep calling? Why won't you say anything? And so on. 
he then starts to say that he's in the house and that he's watching the kids and myself. I try to play it off cool and laugh, asking him sarcastically, Oh yeah? Then where are you? He replies, telling me he's in a closet. Instantly, I remember the six-year-old daughter telling me that she was afraid of the monster hiding in her closet. Before running upstairs, I called the police and told them that I thought someone was in the house. I was almost too afraid to go upstairs, but I somehow did it. I wake the kids up and race downstairs, and we get in the car. I turn it on and pull out, waiting outside the driveway, but not turning the car off. I was told to wait for the police, which was the only thing stopping me from leaving. The police got there and searched the house. They found that all of the knives from the knife holder had been removed and were found in the daughter's closet. Whoever had been there was long gone by the time the police got there. How he got in and out without me noticing, I have no clue. After that experience, I have never babysat again. I live in Coleman, Alabama. On April 15th of 2014, I headed out to mow my lawn. In the front of the ditch of my road, I have tons of bushes and flowers neatly set up. To my surprise, someone had come by and stepped all over my roses. I was deeply upset. The next day, I saw two kids walking down my road. Keep in mind my road has seven houses, so we all know each other. These kids look to be around 12 or 13 years old. I had never seen these kids before. Maybe they were visiting someone was the only thing I could think of. I wanted to go outside and ask them if they messed with my roses, but I figured they're just kids and I'd let it slide this time. The kids stopped walking and just stood on the road right across from my house. That's a good 80 to 90 feet away. They just stood there. I was looking out the window and they were just standing right there. I went to my room to go get my shoes and when I came out, they were gone. Now this is where everything went to hell. It was 8 p.m. and starting to get dark out. My power went off and on a few times. I'm not sure if this had to do with what happened, but it did freak me out. It had finally come back on. At around 8.20, I heard knocking at my front door. Around here, people all tend to know each other, so we usually always open the door to see who it is. I turned on my porch light and looked through the little hole in my door, but it was just pitch black, even though the light was on. I didn't know why, but I was extremely terrified. I started to put my hand on the handle and I asked who's there. Some kid answered. Sorry to bother you, mister, but we're lost. We need to borrow your phone. I have a spare cell phone you can borrow for a few minutes, I told them. Let me go get it and I'll come outside with you. The kid just said, No, you let me in right now and he started banging on my door. I'm not talking about just hitting it, but it was like some grown man was hitting it. I said, Kid, you quit that right now. I have a shotgun, and if you try anything, I will shoot. The kid kept screaming, Let me in now. You're making a mistake. I grabbed the shotgun just in case and held it off to the side of my leg. I put my hand on the lock and unlocked the door. This is where I made my mistake. I opened the door expecting either both of those kids, or just one kid with a weapon or something, but these weren't little kids. Standing at my door were two people, and both looked 12 or 13. Their eyes were pitch black. I felt terrified again. I felt like putting my shotgun down and letting them in. I'm not sure why I felt that way. As I had the door open for those three or four seconds, the taller kids started to walk forward to come in. I kicked my door shut as hard as I could and I locked it. At this point, I heard both of them crying and screaming in a strange, distorted, high-pitched way, followed by some banging on my door again. I went to check my back door just to make sure it was still locked. 
Thankfully, my back door was locked, and by the time I headed to my front door, they had just stopped. I loaded my shotgun and opened the door, expecting these things, but they were gone. I heard some footsteps, and my neighbor was coming by. He heard some weird screams and came by to check on me. I stood there, probably looking like death with a shotgun in my hand. I let him in and told him the eerie event. He told me to call the cops, but I was positive they wouldn't believe me. So I didn't. He left and I spent the next two days without sleeping. I have no idea what those things were. I sometimes have nightmares about them. I'm not sure if anyone else has ever seen these things. But if you ever do, or you hear kids telling you to open the door, grab a weapon and stay inside your house. This story is 100% real and is about an experience I had going on the deep web. For those of you who don't know, the deep web is pretty much the hidden internet. It isn't indexed by search engines, and you need special software to go on it. It is several thousand times bigger than the surface internet, which can be reached by Google, Yahoo, Bing, etc. It is home to many illegal things. You can buy stolen guns, any drug you can imagine, stolen phones, you can even hire hitmen. Any illegal thing you can imagine is on the deep web. I never had a great childhood. My dad was gone all the time, and my mom was too. When she was home, it was normally verbal and physical abuse. I always needed to have a way to escape it all, whether it was playing video games, watching movies, or even drinking. One day, I was invited over to a friend's house for a sleepover. When I got there, he immediately told me that he had something to show me. We went upstairs and he showed me his laptop. He said he had got onto the deep web. We stayed up until late at night browsing through all the interesting things on it. He showed me how to use it and I took some notes. The next day, I decided to try it out for myself. I downloaded the software and was good to go. When on the deep web, there is a page full of links. In order to go to the sites, you keep clicking on the new links that pop up. At first it was very boring, tons of dead websites, or disgusting ones filled with videos of real people getting killed. Eventually I found a forum. I can't remember what it was about but I asked how to get to any interesting sites that were not illegal. One guy sent me a link and said that it was a site that contained leaked government documents. I thought that was interesting, so I clicked on it. When I pulled up the page, I was pretty shocked. It was a whole bunch of videos of people getting tortured, raped, murdered in the most horrible ways. I have a pretty strong stomach, so I was ready to ignore it and just exit out, but I realized that all the videos were playing at once. When I moved the mouse over one, there was no bar to let you pause or stop it. That's when it hit me. They were all thousands of live streams. I clicked on one that said, homeless man kidnapped in my basement. In it. A man was tied to a chair covered in blood. To his left was a table, and on it was a whole bunch of tools like axes, knives, drills, hammers, etc. And there was a hooded man standing by it. On the right of the live stream, there was a chat box, and people were requesting that the hooded man do various things, like cut off the homeless man's hands, rip out his hair, and so on. Eventually, one man in the chat box said that he would pay several bitcoin for the hooded man to gouge out the homeless man's eyes. The hooded man agreed and grabbed what looked like a fork off the table and began to walk to the homeless man. I quickly closed the live stream, but I could still hear it. I tried to leave the site but it was frozen and I could only hear the horrible sounds coming from the stream. Oh. A few seconds later, 
the sound stopped, and a chat box appeared in the center of the screen. I couldn't exit out, but then in the box, somebody typed in, Hello, how do you like the site? I paused for a moment, not sure if it was some kind of automated message, but then he typed again. Are you going to answer? I stayed frozen in place but eventually typed in, Who is this? The guy explained that he was the owner of the site and that he liked to greet first time users whenever he could. I got a disgusted look on my face and this is where things got really scary. In the chat box, the man typed, It's rude to make faces, Jake. My eyes got wide and I noticed my webcam was on when I always keep it off. Also, how did this man know my name? I covered up the webcam with a sticky note and typed, how do you know my name? I'm calling the police. There was a brief pause and then horrifyingly, a whole bunch of data was posted in the box. I looked at it and realized what it was. Everything about me, my full name, email, address, age, it even had all my parents info as well. I panicked and shut off my computer and hoped that it would be the end of that. I did a complete wipe of all my computer's data and went to get a drink. I was under a lot of stress. That night my mom said she wouldn't be home. She didn't say where she was, but at this point in my life I didn't care. My dad of course was nowhere to be seen. I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up watching a movie. I fell asleep on the couch. I don't know why, but at about 2.30 in the morning I woke up. The TV was still on and it gave off a dim light, but when I opened my eyes a little more, I almost screamed. There was a man standing just a few feet away from me with a mask on. I flew off of the couch and darted for the door. I heard heavy footsteps coming after me. I flung open the door and ran outside screaming as loud as I could, trying to get somebody's attention. I looked behind me and saw the man. He was running, and he was faster than me. I screamed louder and noticed I had tears running down my face. Then a bag wrapped around my head and I was pushed to the ground with such force that I felt blood in my mouth. I heard a car speed up beside me, and I was being dragged to the sound of it. They were taking me away and probably I was going to be on that site. I had almost expected my death when the man with the mask screamed in pain and dropped me. I pulled the bag off of my head and saw a van speed away. And I saw my neighbor hitting the masked man with a baseball bat. The police arrived, took the masked man in, eventually caught the van and shut down the site. My mom and I moved out, and I will never ever go on the deep web again, and I encourage others to never go on it either. My earliest memory of the paranormal was when I was about five years old. This story is definitely in the top two of my very strange experiences. My sister, who was six at the time, and I were traveling up to Darwin for a couple of days with my dad. We ended up staying in a hotel halfway through our journey. I remember this hotel very vividly. It was old and had an awful feel to it. My sister and I shared a room. They were bunk beds and I was on the top one. Being very young, I fell asleep quite easily, but I got woken up by the sound of my sister's voice. She was telling someone to go away and that she wasn't scared of it. I turned over and tried to see who she was talking to. This is going to sound very strange, and I can hardly believe I saw this myself. I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in demons. But at our window was this creature. Picture something crossed between a gargoyle and an imp. 
It was sitting at our windowsill, staring in at my sister. She was standing at the window, staring back at it. It licked the window with a massive tongue. It then pointed to her and ran its fingers along its throat. My sister is one of those kids born with this incredible confidence. Nothing scared her. She just kept taunting it. That was it for me, though. I jumped down from my bed and ran into my dad's room. The story took many years for my sister and I to talk about. I was about 12 swapping stories when she brought this up. I spent years thinking that this was one strange dream or a twisted memory. I think I should mention, it wasn't the last time we saw this thing. It followed us around for years. I honestly don't know what to think of this and I don't expect most people to believe me, unless they've experienced something similar. It was the summer of 2013. I was 17 years old at the time when I decided to visit my older sister Lauren in her boyfriend's house where she lives together with his family. She was pregnant at that time and I decided to bring her some fruits and planned to stay there for a few days if they would allow it. When I arrived at their humble home, her future parents-in-law welcomed me. They also offered me to stay for a few days. The two old folks were nice and I called them Uncle Teddy and Aunt Sella. They work in the farm every day together with my sister's boyfriend, Dan. My sister just stays in the house with Juliet, her future sister-in-law, who is also nice to us. While eating some snacks, Lauren told me about a strange, huge black bird that was seen flying around their house a few nights ago. They believed it was a tick-tick, a bird that is used by the Aswang to spy for pregnant women. Lauren is so scared that the stories about Aswangs could be real. There were times during the night that they could hear the sound of a bird and the flapping of its huge wings. They can also hear footsteps on the roof of the house. All that she does is pray and ask for protection. Dan is also ready to protect her with a machete, jar of salt and garlic kept in their room. My first and second nights at their house were peaceful and silent. No signs of the Tic Tic or the Aswang. On the third night, I was sleeping in bed when I was awoken by the screams of Lauren and Juliet. I checked the time on my phone and it was around midnight. I could hear the strong blows of wind outside and the sound of flapping wings. I prayed for protection before I headed to my sister's room. Everyone was already awake. Lauren, Juliet, and Aunt Sella stuck together inside the room praying. Dan was guarding them. Uncle Teddy was outside the room and shouting for the demon bird to leave. We were all on the second floor. Suddenly, this huge bird starts banging the window in Lauren's room. Good thing it had metal grills. Dan opened the window and the huge black bird was revealed in front of us. We were all still shocked by its red eyes. I quickly grabbed the jar of salt and threw some at it. Stay away from us, demon. Leave, I shouted. It got angry and irritated, so it flew around the house looking for an opening. As the huge black bird was circling around the house, we suddenly heard footsteps running on the roof. It's here, the Aswang, said Uncle Teddy. Put salt and garlic on every window, he ordered. Then Uncle Teddy ran downstairs and outside to surround the house with salt while carrying his machete. After a few minutes, we heard Uncle Teddy shout for help. I quickly ran to him while leaving the ladies with Dan. When I got outside, I was shocked to see Uncle Teddy losing a fight against a creature I have never seen before. A man with black skin, his eyes red in color, with fangs in his upper and lower front teeth. He was naked and had facial hair. Uncle Teddy was badly beaten. I noticed that the Aswang was also wounded by my uncle's machete. With all my strength, I charged towards the Aswang and stabbed his left shoulder using a kitchen knife. He quickly grabbed me by the neck and threw me, his strength equal to three adult males. He released an angry loud cry before running towards the fields and the huge black bird followed him. I helped my uncle to stand up. He was wounded by the creature's pointed nails. We didn't sleep that night and we waited until the sun rose. Dan immediately told the neighbors what had happened. Some even heard the shouting but chose to stay inside their homes and ignore it. 
People say that the Aswang will swallow the black bird because it lives inside his stomach. Then the Aswang will return to his normal human form. But at night, he releases the bird to hunt for prey. And then the man will change back into the Aswang demon form. I stayed with my sister for another two weeks just to make sure that the Aswang didn't come back. Luckily, it did not return anymore. And after three months, Lauren gave birth to a healthy baby boy.